Leadership Law Number 4 The Law of Navigation Anyone can steer the ship, but it takes a leader to chart the course. In 1911, two groups of explorers set off on an incredible mission. Though they used different strategies and routes, the leaders of the teams had the same goal, to be the first in history to reach the South Pole. Their stories are life and death illustrations of the law of navigation. One of the groups was led by Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen. Before his team was ever set off, Amundsen had painstakingly planned his trip. He studied the methods of the Eskimos and other experienced Arctic travelers, determining that their best course of action would be to transport all the equipment and supplies by dog sled. When he assembled his team, he chose expert skiers and dog handlers. His strategy was simple. The dogs would do most of the work as the group traveled 15 to 20 miles in a six hour period each day. They would allow both the dogs and the men plenty of time to rest each day for the following day's travel. Amundsen's forethought and attention to detail were incredible. He located and stocked supply depots all along the route. That way they would not have to carry every bit of their supplies with them for the whole trip. He also equipped his people with the best gear possible. Admundsen had carefully considered every possible aspect of the journey, thought it through, and planned accordingly. And it paid off. The worst problem they experienced on the trip was an infected tooth that one man had to have extracted. The other team of men was led by Robert Falcon Scott, a British naval officer with previous Antarctic exploration experience. Scott's expedition was the antithesis of Admundsen's. Instead of using dog sleds, Scott decided to use motorized sledges and ponies. Their problems began when the motors on the sledges stopped working only five days into the trip. The ponies didn't fare well either in those frigid temperatures. When they reached the foot of the Transantarctic Mountains, all the poor animals had to be killed. As a result, the team members themselves ended up hauling the 200-pound sledges. It was arduous work. Scott also hadn't given enough attention to the team's other equipment. Their clothes were so poorly designed that all the men developed frostbite. One team member required an hour every morning just to get his boots on to his swollen gangrenous feet. And everyone became snowblind because of the inadequate goggles that Scott had supplied. On top of everything else, the team was always low on food and water. That was also due to Scott's poor planning. The depots of supplies Scott established were inadequately stocked, too far apart, and often poorly marked, making them very difficult to find. Because they were continually low on fuel to melt snow, everyone became dehydrated. Making things even worse was Scott's last-minute decision to take along a fifth man, even though they had prepared enough supplies for only four people. After covering a grueling 800 miles in 10 weeks, Scott's exhausted group finally arrived at the South Pole on January 17, 1912. There they found the Norwegian flag flapping in the wing and a letter from Amundsen. The other well-led team had beaten them to their goal by more than a month. As bad as their trip to the pole was, that isn't the worst part of their story. The trek back was horrific. Scott and his men were starving and suffering from scurvy, but Scott, unable to navigate to the very end, was oblivious to their plight. With time running out and desperately low on food, Scott insisted that they collect 30 pounds of geological specimens to take back, more weight to be carried by their worn-out men. Their progress became slower and slower. One member of the party sank into a stupor and died. Another purposely walked out into a blizzard to relieve the group of himself as a liability. Scott and his final two team members made it only a little further north before giving up. The return trip had taken two months and still they were 150 miles from their base camp. There they died. We know their story only because they spent their last hours writing in their diaries. Some of Scott's last words were these, we shall die like gentlemen. I think this will show that the spirit of pluck and power to endure has not passed out of our race. Robert Fountain Scott had courage, but not leadership. 
Because he was unable to live by the law of navigation, he and his companions died by it. Followers need leaders who are able to effectively navigate for them. When they're facing life and death situations, that necessity becomes painfully obvious. But at other times, even though the consequences are not as serious, the need is just as great. The truth is, just about anyone can steer the ship, but it takes a leader to chart the course. That is the law of navigation. I remember the first time I really understood the importance of the law of navigation. I was 28 years old and I was leading my second church, Faith Memorial, in Lancaster, Ohio. Before my arrival there in 1972, the church had experienced a decade-long plateau in its growth. But by 1975, our attendance had gone from 400 to more than 1,000, and I knew that we could keep growing and reach more people, but only if we built a new auditorium. It was going to be a huge multi-million dollar project. Although that made it quite a challenge, that was not my greatest obstacle. What made the task tough was that right before I came on board at Faith Memorial, there had been a huge battle over a building proposal, and the debate had been vocal, divisive, and bitter. For that reason, I knew that as I led this project, I would experience genuine opposition to my leadership for the very first time. There were rough waters ahead, and if I, as a leader, didn't navigate us well, I could sink the ship. At that time, I developed a strategy that I have used repeatedly in my leadership. I wrote it as an acrostic, spelling out the words, plan ahead, so that I would always be able to remember it. It says, the letter P, predetermine a course of action. The letter L, lay out your goals. The letter A, adjust your priorities. The letter N, notify key personnel. The letter A, allow time for acceptance. The letter H, head into action. The letter E, expect problems. The letter A, always point to the successes. And the letter D, daily review your plan. That became my blueprint as I prepared to navigate for my people. I knew exactly what our course of action needed to be. I had looked at every possible alternative, and I knew that building a new auditorium was our only viable solution. My goal was to design and build the facility, pay for it in 10 years, and unify all the people in the process. I started preparing for the congregational meeting where I would gain approval for the project. The first thing I did was direct our board members and a group of key financial leaders to conduct a 20-year analysis of our growth and financial patterns covering the previous 10 years and projecting the next 10 years. Based on that, we formulated a 10-year budget that carefully explained how we would handle the financing. I put it and all the other necessary information into a 20-page report that I intended to give to the members of the congregation. My next step was to notify the key leaders. I started with ones who had the most influence, meeting with them individually and sometimes in small groups. Over the course of several weeks, I met with about a hundred leaders. I cast the vision for them and I fielded their questions. Then I allowed time for the rest of the people in the congregation to be influenced by those leaders who were already on board. When the time rolled around for the congregational meeting, we were ready to head into action. I took two hours to present the project to the people. I handed out my 20-page report with floor plans, financial analysis, and budgets. I tried to answer every question the people might have before they had a chance to ask it. I also requested that some of the most influential individuals in the congregation speak about the project to the people. I had expected some opposition, but when I opened the floor for questions, I was shocked. There were only two questions. One person wanted to know about the placement of the building's water fountains, and the other asked about the number of restrooms. That was when I knew that we had navigated the tricky water successfully. When the final count was tallied, 98% of the people had voted in favor. That was a wonderful learning experience for me. Above everything else, I found out that the secret of the law of navigation is preparation. When you over-prepare, you convey confidence and trust in the people. Lack of preparation has the opposite effect. You see, it's not the size of the project that determines its acceptance, support, and success. It's the size of the leader. 
That's why I say that anyone can steer the ship, but it takes a leader to chart the course. And if you're a good navigator, you're capable of taking your people just about anywhere.